good to go now? Okay. Thank you so much for being here. Um, it is a pleasure for me to be here speaking about these issues. I'm Juan Pablo Escudero. I'm the staff attorney here at the Emmet Institute. I'm also from Chile, so for me it's very exciting to hear so many references to Chile, which is very unusual in North America. Um, and uh, as one environmental activist told me, uh, mining companies do one thing right. They are great at finding minerals uh, in very pristine ecosystem, sacred, sacred sites, or where undermined communities are. So, and that is not really a funny joke. It is a kind of a reality. So as Secretary Christina Snyder, a study said, how can we do this right? How can jurisdictions pur pursue this much needed energy transition with a commitment to environmental justice, right? Um, so I'm here with an all-star panel. Uh, we couldn't have better panel to speak about these issues. Um, first, we're joined by uh, Janet Wilson. She's a senior environmental reporter for the Desert Sun, one of the most relevant newspapers in California. And she's been working, has extensive experience in Southern California and the desert. So thank you for being here. Cristina Dorador is here with us as well. He came all the way from Chile just for speak at this panel. Um, Cristina is a professor of microbiology at the Universidad de Antofagasta, and she was also elected as one of the Constitutional Assembly members to wrote the new Chilean constitution after the Chilean process. So she has extensive experience and she has very been a um, very vocal activist uh, for um, communities in the desert salt plains where lithium exists. Um, we are also very honored to have you here, Chairman Tortes. Uh, Mr. Thomas Tortes is the chairman of the Torres Martinez Desert Cahuilla Indians. He's a key figure here in Southern California and he serves um, in several board members, in several boards such as the Salton Sea Authority, among others. So thank you so much for here. We are very honored with your presence. And last but not least, um, Mr. Luis Olmedo here. He's the executive director of the Comité Civico del Valle, an organization that aims to improve the lives of the disadvantaged communities by informing, educating, and engaging communities' civic participation. Um, so uh, in terms of the format, we're not innovating. Sorry to disappoint you. We are doing a conversational <laughs> style here and let our panelists speak as freely as possible. Um, these are very complicated issues, so um, thank you for the respect you will have with, for all of our panelists. So I would like to first panelists will speak for seven to eight minutes and then seven to eight minute questions and then we will uh, leave time for a question from the audience. So I would like to start with you, Janet. Thank you for being here again. And um, please tell us a little bit about your work and the general situation there in Salton Sea and the lithium mining projects that are being developed there. Thank you. I love that we're bringing this back home, so to speak, to California after traveling around the globe, although we also have a very distinguished guest from another key region with lithium deposits. So I don't have a PowerPoint. I'm also going on about three and a half hours of sleep. So forgive any uh, verbal flubs that may emerge. Um, I'm going to try and paint a picture of a unique place that holds both tremendous promise and potential risk for powering the future with clean energy, which uh, obviously we need to do something. Uh, three hours south of here by car, if there's not a lot of LA traffic, sits the hot, beautiful Imperial Valley carved uh, out of the California desert. At its northern end sits the Salton Sea, which JP alluded to. It is the largest water body in California, not Lake Tahoe. It is a gorgeous, shimmering, and badly contaminated uh, water body. The main business in Imperial is farming, and runoff from 400 square miles of fields is what has kept the sea alive for the past several decades. But that runoff is loaded with now a century's worth of pesticides, fertilizers, and sewage that flows north from Mexico via the new river, which has been dubbed America's most polluted river. Uh, with transfers over the past 18, 20 years of water from Imperial Farms to uh, California urban areas, the sea is now rapidly drying. And with the regular wind uh, storms, 
down there come airborne dust clouds kicked up from this ever widening seashore. So that's the picture above ground. Um, but like much of California, the area is also incredibly geologically active. Uh, so tucked two miles underground uh, are boiling hot brine reserves that were first discovered by an oil, I was told, by an oil company in the 1950s, Unical, that was drilling for new crude. And instead, they found this gritty liquid, 700 degrees Fahrenheit or more, uh, and instead of oil fields, a dozen power plants have gradually been built along the edge of the Salton Sea. The, the brine is pumped up and it's flashed into steam power that is so much cleaner than coal or natural gas, uh, although it is not completely free of pollutants, contrary to what some might tell you, uh, but it is a lot cleaner. Um, for years, the power companies for decades re-injected this gritty byproduct of the steam back underground. But about 15 years ago, a guy named Elon Musk and others uh, started visiting the area. They realized that this grit is actually loaded with minerals, including lithium, which as we've heard, is a key ingredient in batteries for everything. One thing that hasn't been mentioned is that ties into Imperial County is it's also a key ingredient in these new large scale um, solar and wind uh, batteries uh, for storing the, the uh, rich power we're starting to get out of the California desert in Imperial County. So um, what was a waste byproduct uh, has now been dubbed white gold because it's got this sort of soft silvery whitish color. And as we've heard, 80 to 90 percent of the world's lithium is currently refined in China which has a huge export market. One figure I saw last night is a trade volume of $9.3 billion in 2022 alone. And China's lithium ion batteries account for the vast majority of US imports today, as we've heard. But um, the federal studies have shown that this immense reserve below Imperial County can, contains enough lithium for 375 million electric vehicles or 10 times the current world supply. And it could potentially be produced via a far less damaging process than hard rock mining that you get uh, in um, South America or the vast evaporation ponds that you see which destroy large swaths of land. Uh, including often sacred places, as has been alluded to. Um, in Imperial, companies say they can use something called DLE, if you see that term in business pieces, direct lithium extraction. Pumping up the brine, as they always have for steam, and then separating out the lithium and potentially other needed minerals. Turns out there's a lot of manganese in there too. Uh, needless to say, federal, state, and local officials are thrilled with having a huge potential source of domestic lithium that could also, in theory, be produced in an environmentally friendly way. It's a win-win. Uh, in the past few years, uh, we've had Governor Gavin Newsom, numerous White House and Department of Energy officials, John Podesta was the most recent. Uh, they've all visited the area, as have uh, a lot of South Korean battery makers, and Stellantis and General Motors have both invested in pilot projects and signed procurement agreements. Um, there are s numerous uh, startup companies uh, that have also discovered this remote stretch of Carol California. And right now there's three main contenders vying to build the first commercial DLE extraction plants there. Uh, and it's turned out to be a lot harder than they expected. Uh, that salty grit that contains the lithium also continually clogs filters. <laughs> Uh, it rusts pipes, brand new pipes look like, you know, they are uh, decades old. And in general, uh, it's just not proved cooperative. Uh, but two startups, one out of San Diego and another originally from Australia, both now say that they've mastered proprietary techniques to do it. The third is the big kahuna, Berkshire Hathaway Renewables, which is an arm of Warren Buffett's empire, owns, has bought 10 of those um, geothermal steam plants and is seeking to build three more. They just got some key approvals. And uh, they're not saying they're gonna produce lithium yet, but they have also been pushing to develop technology to refine commercial forms of lithium. 
but there's another key factor here. And uh, that is the people <laughs> of Imperial County. Um, this is one of the most impoverished corners of the state and the country. And it regularly has the highest unemployment in the nation. It was 18.3%, I think it was in December, uh, compared to like 3% in the US and 8% in California maybe. Anyway, 18 point plus percent. People here also have heard a lot of promises from a lot of outsiders over many decades, particularly in the north end of Imperial, which is closest to the Salton Sea and where you have the very poorest communities. So there's a state prison that was supposed to bring high paying jobs and new housing stock to the North End, didn't happen. The Obama administration, lots of sunshine there, right? Uh, said commercial solar would revitalize these dying towns, but the big solar companies cut deals, tax deals and uh, with county officials that were then in office. And so little to no community benefits actually arrived. So um, those are just two of many examples. There is now cautious hope, I'd say, about the jobs and the spending that uh, Lithium Valley, as the area we've heard the area has been dubbed, could bring to the 180,000 people who live there. But it is definitely tempered with these memories of the past. Um, and building a major industrial zone uh, in a remote rural area could also have some unintended consequences. The scale of change would be enormous. So-called Lithium Valley is a place with no broadband, very little wireless service, unpaved roads, and very little housing stock. So kind of like some of what we saw in Africa on the last panel. Um, it's also a biologically rich place. It's home to dozens of rare and in many cases endangered species of birds and fish. Uh, there are also sites in the North End, uh, as others here know far better than me, that have been sacred to area tribes for potentially millennia. So what impacts will plopping an 81 square mile industrial zone down in this region have? How many hundreds of diesel truck trips a day will there be, for instance? Uh, people living near the fast drying Salton Sea already suffer the state's highest asthma rates and have elevated heart disease. Um, two of my fellow panelists are living these realities on the ground and know a lot more than I ever will. But in an effort to create a jobs rich, ecologically sound new development zone, California did convene this uh, Lithium Valley Commission comprised of all sides. They came out with some recommendations. We'll see how it shakes out. Um, there's mixed feelings, I think, about that too. Uh, but there was a lot of hard work put into it, no question. Local officials have also bargained very hard in Sacramento, and they got the Newsom administration to pledge almost half a billion dollars, uh, $400 million for Lithium Valley, including $80 million for a new UCA, UC San Diego campus to train young people for engineering and other good jobs there. Uh, for major transmission lines from this remote area and funding for a one-time programmatic environmental impact study for those of you who are studying environmental law rather than duking it out project by project because the developers, the entire planet and nation wants to start refining this stuff and using it. So they want to speed up that environmental review process. Um, uh, so uh, they've also included some monies to enable environmental justice groups who have less funds than the would-be developers typically to hire their own experts to evaluate plans. So the intent, uh, the goodwill has been let's try and do it right up front this time. You know, use a more environmentally friendly process and make sure everybody is included. Imperial County also rung a per ton lithium tax out of the legislature and the governor and the companies have agreed to use union labor. Uh, so um, there's a lot of potential wins there, but there's also still significant uncertainty. Uh, as we've heard, lithi lithium prices have tanked globally recently and there's an attempt now uh, to repeal the per ton lithium tax on the ballot in California statewide in November. That overall streamlined programmatic environmental document has not yet been finished, was supposed to be done already, and construction has begun on the first commercial scale plant 
even as the developer and the county face the threat of a lawsuit alleging inadequate CEQA, California Environmental Quality Act reviews, were done, as one of the fellow panelists on here could tell you more about. So the promise is still there, right there beneath everyone's feet, but the next three to five years, I think, will prove critical, not just to international markets and domestic supply, but to the people living right there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Janet. Very interesting. Now, Cristina, could you please take us to Chile? What's happening there? Yeah. First, um, thank you so much to the Emmet Institute for the invitation, um, and you, Juan Pablo, and Alex. I'm very honored to be here. Well, yeah, I'm talk about um, what's happening in Chile, especially in this very, very unique ecosystem that we have, uh, not just in Chile, also in, in, in Argentina and Bolivia, that called locally salares, also the translation could be salt flats or saline lakes, depends of the of what we, we, how we define those ecosystems. But before to start, I would like to mention that the, the, the main topic of this seminar is uh, critical minerals. So the colleague here mentioned many times critical for whom, but also I would like to say that when we're talking about critical minerals, we necessarily are talking about nature and ecosystems because all minerals are located in ecosystems. So therefore any mine or any type of mining will always affect at some point the environment. So for any type of discussion regarding this subject, we need to put the communities and the environment at the center. So um, well, in Chile, the, the lithium extraction happening in these uh, salares, there are extreme environments as I mentioned before, um, they're usually located at high altitudes and, and they have very specific uh, and unique environmental condition. For example, there we receive the highest solar radiation on Earth and it's, it's very impressive that because it's, uh, it's, the amount of solar radiation is equivalent to the extraterrestrial irradiance. So all the communities living there, including humans, we have a special adaptation, or we are adapted to the time to live there. So it's not easy to live on the Takama Desert. Also, um, this um, aquatic ecosystem, they, they, the evaporative basin, so they have a negative water balance. Always they evaporate more water than they receive. Also, they're very variable. Any lake is similar to the other, they're very different. They have uh, a very high biodiversity and high endemism. Therefore, they are considered fragile ecosystem when very small changes can produce massive um, f uh, consequences. And also, very important point that in many, many of these uh, salares are, are places where live different indigenous communities that are living in this area for more than 13,000 years before the present. And there are different communities uh, depending where we're, we're looking. So, for example, there are Aymara, Quechua. Atacameño, Olicarantay, and Coya. So the, when we mentioned the, the, that lithium is in, in, in these countries and, and also in the Salton Sea, it's obtaining from water. They were talking about brines. It's not uh, sterile waters or, or, or just uh, hypersaline waters. There are, there are whole uh, places where living different species. Um, my specialty is microbiology. So we, we, we study the microorganisms living in ex extreme conditions and extreme environment. And, and usually people don't know about that because they're of course they're invisible. <laughs> so it's very difficult to show that invisible organisms will be affected by lithium extraction that at the same time, uh, all the narratives surrounding lithium extraction are very positive. So everyone is talking about even some companies say lithium will save the world. So it's very complicated <laughs> from a scientific point of view. But what I want to show you here is a, a complex system. So it's not just water with salt, yeah, more than that, of course. They're very dynamic. Microorganisms are the base for the whole trophic web, uh, uh, are the basis of the, of the, of the feeding of uh, other animals like the charismatic flamingos. So of course, there are many, many other um, biogeochemical cycles happening here, and also very important as a source of, uh, and think as well, of um, um, greenhouse gases. So 
um, Atacama, um, Salar de Atacama, this is a satellital picture of Salar de Atacama, have suffering uh, very, very important changes through the time. I think I had an animation, but uh, I couldn't show you here. And this is how it started in, in the end of the, of the 80s. But now almost all the area is, is uh, a bit larger part, is full of these uh, evaporation ponds that are the source of lithium for for a long time. I mean, I mean in, in probably most of your batteries here using the, the cell phone, are the lithium are coming from Chile, and also the copper. So I, I really like this image that you uh, have a little bit of the Atacama Desert in your lives. And yeah, of course, the, so the pressure to obtain lithium is very, very high, the, um, of course, regarding the high demand for, uh, especially for AVs. But we have a long history of exploitation of this uh, saline system, the Salares. So the economical history of Chile is strongly associated with the Salares. Before, uh, at the beginning of the, of the 20th century, uh, we had this massive extraction of uh, salitre or nitrates where actually the, the, the place where nitrate is, is, is located are, are fossil salares. And the water that was used to obtain those minerals as well coming from subterranean water of the Atacama Desert, the driest places on earth. Then the, the copper as well, uh, to obtain copper we need water of course in the Atacama Desert. So uh, water for, for copper production also have been used directly from salares. So when we export um, copper concentrate, also there is a mixture with water of salaris and maybe lithium as well. So we know that all mining industry need water and energy and the water is essential for, for copper miners typically being obtained from salaris and causing a lot of environmental damage. So we have a lot to learn from, from the Atacama Desert. I think that is something that, um, that's why it's important to, to study also what happened in the past. So currently we are living, uh, as I said, at the world level, a declining of saline lakes. It's not just happening in Chile or, or in South America, it's just everywhere because of climate change. So water levels in saline lakes are declining everywhere. Uh, we reported uh, recently that uh, a decrease of up to 30% in the surface water of, uh, in the area since 1984 for at least five salaries. And this decline is associated with increasing rate of potential evapotranspiration, so the recent effect of climate change, but also the decreasing of groundwater related to mining industry. So uh, specifically, uh, in, in the case of the flamingos, we, we reported that the, the, the population of the endemic flamingos, James and Andean, have decreased uh, their, their numbers by 10 or 12 percent in just 11 years. So the, the, the changes that are happening in the area are really dramatic, and we expect them to also to a, a very important loss of biodiversity in the next year because of uh, all these simultaneous changes that are happening. So um, also I, I would like to mention about the, the lithium narrative. Um, I'm, as I mentioned before, I'm coming from the scientific world. Um, um, I don't know. Ten years ago, I, I, very w I was just focusing and studying my, my, my bacteria, a very interesting organism. But then I started to realize that the, the places that we were studying uh, have been in, in intervened uh, in, a, in a massive way. And I nobody really cared about what's happening with the salaries. Uh, to have took a long, long time to, to mention in different media and also in, in congresses and with, with many people that salaries need to be protected. So um, there are some narrative like a very favor, of course, to the industry and, and, and all this uh, energetic transition that's very important, of course, but ignoring what's really happening in this ecosystem. And at the same time, salaries are, are treated like a, a thing. For example, people are selling salaries. That's called in the Spanish salaries a la venta. And, and for the other way, it's, it's very complicated to, to, to really came for a, like, a, like a main conclusion what we are doing. So I bring here some thought that maybe we can develop later. So th this, this region where I'm coming from uh, and, and actually born there includes uh, most of the, it's, it's one of the most important uh, region for mining in Chile. Previously nitrous, as I mentioned, now copper and increasing lithium and as well having the most marked history of environmental and social injustice. 
So lithium is a key element for energetic transition. Nevertheless, the extraction from brines and evaporation ponds produce the irreversible damage of the ecosystem because salares are terminal ecosystems, so any change will have massive consequences. So new technologies that have been mentioned also uh, before are urgently need to improve the extraction of lithium, for example, direct lithium extraction, but their development needs an interdisciplinary approach. And of course, including in this conversation, indigenous communities is very, very important. But the development of this technology by themselves are not a solution. Usually people really focus on a technological solution to avoid this problem, but it's, it's not that way. So we will also need to include in this conversation new approaches, for example, limits of the exploitation or the planetary limits. We have a finite planet. And also to preserve this unique ecosystem. And currently the, the, the Chilean government is working to protect at least 30% of those uh, system based on the 30 plus 30 agreement in the COP15. But uh, at the same time, it's very urgent and an intensive research plan to develop science and technology in the region to not, not only add value to this um, industry, but also to understand uh, the nature and the consequences of those uh, massive lithium extraction in the area. Thank you. Thank you, Okri. Um, <laughs> please, go ahead. Um, thank you so much, Christina. And Luis, um, could you please tell us a little bit about your organization and what's your opinion on the developments over the Salton Sea area? Yes. So um, I've um, heard a lot of perspectives today. Um, Chairman Tortoise and myself, um, and, and actually Jana, you live on up there as well, right? A um, little bit to the north. Little to yeah. the north. Yes, yeah, closest one, sorry. Mm -hmm. Inland and myself. California is in the house. <laughs> and so, um, you know, what's our opinion of it? Um, today's panels, you know, talk so many different perspectives. There's so much excitement. We're just as excited, too. We're, um, I guess it's important for you to know that I'm an environmental justice advocate. I've been doing this work for 24 years in the Imperial Valley. Our organization has been around for 35 years. It's a farm worker founder organization to address the injustices and the assignment of harm to the benefit of privilege. We've always been time and time promised the next best thing. Okay? Again, let me be clear, we're in support, but we're not in support of being at our expense because we can't afford it. We, the disadvantaged population that lives in the Imperial Valley and around the Salton Sea. So the Imperial Valley is our source of water. It comes from the Colorado. And we're living perhaps the, well, we are living the histor historical drought. We provide the majority of winter vegetables to your table. So sometimes I think about if I were to have time machine, I go 130 years back, okay, to when the next big thing, which was agriculture, we would probably would have addressed the poisoning of our water, poisoning of our air, poisoning of our land, and we would have averted a climate crisis that now this state and every taxpayer is having to pay for in our community, because that became the sump for agriculture. And now we're having to breathe that. So when we get sick, you as a taxpayer pay for us because we can't afford insurance. Okay? We're all connected in this economy. And if we want to kick the can down the road, we're going to continue to create crisis after crisis. People who don't like paying taxes, guess what? You're going to pay taxes. And you're going to pay for us. Because we have the highest prevalence of asthma. During COVID, we had the highest mortality rates, it's a stew of toxics. And we're neighbors to Mexico. They have different regulations. They have good regulations, they just don't enforce them. Right? Mm -hmm. We don't enforce them as we should, okay? Our water isn't protected. We have a Clean Water Act, but if we were to protect that water, I imagine there's an economic concern that the water won't be affordable for agriculture. 
So the federal government cuts a deal, and our water is categorized um, or characterized as um, agricultural water. That's what our utility char characterizes that. So um, that means that when we get it in a municipal um, municipality, that's when we begin to treat the water at more expensive. Okay. These projects are going to consume massive amounts of water at a point in time that environmental justice and fence line communities can't even afford their water. Okay. During the Obama administration, we had the next best thing, which was solar. The environmental groups, I mean, environmental justice, the environmental groups who do a good job in protecting the ecosystem, wildlife, habitat, made sure that undisturbed lands weren't disturbed. I agree with that. So, they, so the companies, the developers of solar, went after agricultural land, okay? They took out hundreds upon hundreds, perhaps thousands of acres of productive agricultural land, killed jobs, and every company that provided services to this land, well, they, guess what? They lost business. So sometimes we think we're doing the right thing and we're getting excited, but you know what? This panel, this, this forum today, it's great because now you get to hear all perspectives because we can't be tunnel vision. We can't just be like, hey, it's exciting. Let's do this, do this, not miss the opportunity. Well, guess what? At some point, we're going to pay the price, okay? We are in favor, but we can't afford it. So we need to make sure that the companies that come out here and develop, they're mitigating 100% of the impacts or pollution that they're going to generate. We need to make sure that they create good local jobs. Sign on to wherever applicable project labor agreements because those produce good jobs and good benefits. The land that is out there that is right now currently um, uh, being speculated for mining lithium and other minerals, it's public lands. So those minerals under the earth there they're public patrimony. We need royalties. We need profit shares. Because when's the last time you made an investment and you didn't? You said, hey, I don't want a return. I'm sure there's economists and investors here, right? I mean, if you're investing, you want a return. If we're investing minerals, if we're investing our public water, if we're investing our public land, what makes anybody believe that we don't want a return in our investment? Okay, it's not free, okay? It's just like conservative minds saying there are no free lunches. But what applies to everyone, including the industry? We are in favor and we are in support, but we're not gonna stand on the sidelines as we get rolled over. And that's why we as an organization have stepped up, okay? One of the things that, we, that California has done, and perhaps even the US, is that they've stepped in to make sure that housing happen in our communities because locally we couldn't make that happen, okay? In Imperial, we also have Department of Toxics who had to step in because we very pro-industry and very lenient when it comes to enforcing toxics. So we're in a point in time that the fate of our community is in a very relaxed system that was created for agriculture over the last 130 years to make sure that agriculture got everything that they need so that all of you can get food on the table. Well, industry like lithium mining and energy don't get to have that same sweetheart deal, okay? Because even those policies that exist in the book are not, go not going far enough. So we have to make sure that we have the federal government, we have the state stepping in, not just being cheerleaders, let's make this happen, let's not, no. We have to be responsible, okay? Because we have to make sure that the ad math adds up. What are we doing? Um, as We're not just being an environmental justice as some might perceive it as like, oh, they're just complaining. No, we don't. Because I can tell you right now that our organization is building the largest infrastructure of electric vehicle chargers, the fastest and the largest in the Imperial Valley or Lithium Valley. 
It's not the industry that came in and says, we want to mine minerals and we're all about renewable energy. They're about mining. Okay, we're doing business here. Okay, we need that mineral because we want to transition to a cleaner um, uh, emissions future. We want to divest from fossil fuel that has impoverished our communities, that had contaminated our communities. They want to create a new economy, an economy that is a local economy. Let's put chargers in our community. Let's us own it now. Let's us own that, own that fuel and that economy and return it into our neighborhoods. As a nonprofit, that's what we're going to do. Those are opportunities where the industry can step up and say, hey, we're about that. Let's get some early investments. Let's put some chargers because California left you out because they were so focused on metropolitan areas, right? The U.S. left us out for the same reasons, okay? Those are opportunities. Right now, we're pushing a bill, actually pushing, but uh, sponsoring a bill. I said it wrong. <laughs> AB 2757. Hey, that's street language, right? <laughs> so, so AB, 27, 20, AB 2757, economic zones bills. Why? Because our region, the Salton Sea, split in two counties, in two regions. Coachella is with Riverside. Imperial is with San Diego. That makes no economic sense for us. That's why all of a sudden you have everybody coming in. Yeah, we're, we welcome you, but coordinate with us. Talk to us. We live there, right? That way we can design it together, what a region looks like, what a mega region looks like. But you don't get to come into our community and just say, oh, step aside. You know, Lithium Valley is Arizona. Lithium Valley is Nevada. Lithium Valley is San Diego. Lithium Valley is LA. No, that might have happened 130 years ago. But we have advocates on the ground. We're no longer allow, are, are allowing ourselves to be pushed around. We're going to be there and we're stepping up. Unfortunately, our system failed us. We have this wonderful law called the California Environmental Quality Act. Some might like it, some might don't. I, I think it's better than nothing. <laughs> so as permits are coming in, what's happening? Well, we leave it to a few people to decide, as they have historically. There's nothing to see here. We need jobs. Nothing to see here. You get a job. Well, what about my investment? Well, when was the last time I invested in Wall Street? And then they, they tell me, oh, you, all you get is a job. Again, we file an appeal. Same thing happens at the, at the county's appeals board. Leaves us no choice but to um, notify that, that we have an intent to file litigation. The system failed us. And it leaves it to a nonprofit to have to step up and have to threaten litigation in order for us to be able to have a seat at the table, okay? Again, um, there's a lot I'd like to share, but I'm sure I have plenty of opportunity. We can't just be copy-pasting environmental um, uh, reports just because one made it through. You don't get to, you know, every time just copy-paste and think, oh, it's all going to be the same. Um, we want to make sure that um, we're looking at not only the, re the local impacts of the industry, but also the cumulative impacts. We want to make sure that water usage, hazardous generation, air impacts, all are being addressed. And, uh, and again, I just mentioned it right now, the sound bites, right? Job creation, job creation, job creation. Man, why are you going to make me work? Right? That's all I get, more work? I want to make sure we have schools, hospitals, roads. You know, I want to have a profit share in our communities. Like some, some states have negotiated it. Uh, uh, profit sharing. We want to make sure we do that. Those are our minerals. Those are our resources. We welcome the industry, but we're not going to be sidelined. We're not. Okay? We want the same deal that Beverly Hills gets. We want the same deal that Santa Monica gets. We want the same deal that La, La Jolla and the Palm Springs get. We want that same deal. But you know what? Maybe we want it better because now we're dealing with, with, with transitional minerals. I know everybody wants to call them critical minerals. Everybody wants to call them national security, right? That's fine. Call it whatever you want. These are transitional minerals. 
because it's a depletable resource. Let's try to get off of fossil fuel. Let's try to get these uh, minerals on the market. But we're going to make sure that this is a fair deal for all of us. I welcome all of you to talk to us in our community. But nobody gets to steal our stories. Nobody gets to talk for us. Okay? We welcome you. And you in general, anyone, right? We welcome you to come to our community. And we're no longer willing to just be talked about, wrote about. If it's not about us, then I don't know where planet you're at. Okay? You in general, anyone. All right? There's books being written, literature being done, studies being done without us. Okay? Do it. And we're going to call it out every time. So if you want to be at that risk level, go for it. We'll call out your book. We'll protest your book. We'll protest your research. But we welcome you with open arms. Be with us. Okay? Because we need you. You get the message? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Luis. Very inspiring and touching. Um, Chairman Tortes, please, your turn. Um, how are traditional communities and your community dealing with these issues? Thank you um, for having me here. My name is uh, Thomas Tortes. I am the Tribal Council Chairman for the Torres Martinez Desert Cahuilla. So, and I am from my mother's clan in the desert, the Ivoqualatem and the South Paquic, which is my father's clan in the mountains. So we, as a people, have been, as you can look it up, that we've been here since time immemorial in the Coachella Valley, numbering between 60 to 90,000 before 1850, before California became a state. And our numbers dwindled due to the smallpox, due to relocation, due to you know us being in a concentration camp called reservations. So we now, our place where we are, we have a number of 1,000 tribal members, but we have nine other reservations that have the same. So as the, when you ask the question how the tribes and how Native Americans are dealing with companies like this with mining, uh, mining has always been devastating and it has a neg negative impact on indigenous peoples as we know throughout the world, globally. Locally, uh, when you talk about within the Southern California, Western United States, in 2022 of October, Arizona, the tribe of Halapai, is battling lithium mining in Arizona and how it's going to, like we're mentioning, how it's going to devastate the ecosystem, the social system, the health and education of the people that are there. In July 2023, just last year, uh, for the Paiute and Shoshone people of Nevada and Oregon, the United States Appeals Court denied uh, the tribes to block the construction on federal land, the Thacker Pass mine, which is another lithium mine. So when we're talking about this mine here now, today, the Quichon tribe has avidly opposing, and they're getting support from the Nevada and Arizona tribes, opposing this mine because of lack of inclusion. So, uh, if it was from the beginning and the start of the people that, and the powers that be had the, the you know, respect to come to the tribes and say, we're gonna do this on your land, on your ancestral land. So the reason they're opposing it is because it's their land before there were cities, before there were borders, where they were able to do their spirit walk. So when you have a company that wants to come in and uh, just tear it up and drill on it and and without any, you know, thought of what the repercussions would be, of course they're going to oppose it. There, there are also gold mines right there in Imperial County that the Quichon tribe has opposed. But, uh, you know, again, it's like, you know, they're invisible. And just today I got news from Washington, D.C. that the federal court voted six to five to, uh, they refused to protect an ancient Native American sacred site from destruction by a multinational mi mining giant. And this puts on the case on, uh, this case on fast track to the Supreme Court, and it's called Apache Stronghold versus United States, where the panel of 11 judges of the Ninth Cir uh, Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that the federal government can transfer the sacred site Oak Flat 
to the company called Resolution Copper, and it's a foreign-owned company that plans to turn the site into a mining crater. So again, you know, it just seems like uh, when we're trying to oppose, when we're trying to get consultation in, it seems like we're invisible, and invisible people. And and to that point, I want to uh, remind and show everybody. Uh, I think you may recognize this. This is the seal of California. What the seal of California. And when you look up the seal of California and you look up what every part of that means, it shows the ships and the bay, which shows how people came into the bay and it produced fruitful uh, avenues for the state of California. There's 31 stars because the California became the 31st state in 1850. It shows the goddess Minerva because it, it means that she was born adult, which is parallels to California becoming a state without having to be, become a territory. It shows the grizzly bear, which we no longer have in California. And last but least, what I want to point out is that it shows a miner. So California was born on mining. When discovery of gold came, they wanted to make sure that, you know, now it's a state because you have gold, right? And it helped fund the Civil War. The same with Nevada. The gold was discovered there, and it helped fund the Civil War. So um, when we talk about the tribes, you know, and, and their perspective and how we're affected with this. Uh, we, as our tribe, was consulted with CTR, Berkshire Hathaway, Tesla, General Motors. All of these huge power companies have been in my office and they've come to talk to me and they've come to talk about community development. And they said, we're gonna, you know, made promises. We're gonna help this, we're gonna help you do that. They wanted to know what our barriers were and we're the same as you know, what was said here, we do not have broadband in our area. Our kids can't, you know, they can't do homework because there's lack of broadband in the area. Uh, there's no water infrastructure. There's a uh, lack of, you know, electricity in, in certain areas, power outages every year because of the uh, demand of power. And so we have to deal with power outages when it's 125 degrees, but you know, we, we manage. So with all of those said, when we told these companies that these are where we could use help, they said, okay, we promise that we'll help you. We'll help you with the community benefit to your tribe, to the uh, cities of Imperial County and the southern areas of Riverside County. And that was two years ago. And since then, you know, the kind of the meetings that they were coming to and, and saying that if, we, if they could have our support, we would have that exchange. And since two years, the meetings have become far and few between. Now they don't answer our calls. Although they have, I've seen in the news where they put on there, we're parting with Torres Martinez and we're gonna create uh, community benefits for them. So the last time they came last week, they wanted a letter of intent. We said no, because you know, we, we haven't seen any, we haven't seen any, uh, any partnership. Where's the plan? Uh, Berkshire Hathaway has also published that they're creating a electron, uh, electrical conveyance to Southern California with all of these new geothermal plants that they're building, it's gonna be megawatts of power going to Southern California and Arizona. Well, where does this land, I mean, where does this conveyance go through? When I was at a press conference uh, last year at CTR, when they did a ribbon cutting, governor was there, I was there and I did a speech because then I was like in support, I was believing in the promise. And the governor did his speech and did his, you know, wherewithal and then he turned around and said, I'm glad that Chairman Tortoise is here because all this energy that is being created by these geothermal plants has to come and go through the Torres Martinez Reservation, right? So it's like, okay, well, thanks for the notice, <laughs> all right, and the consultation. So we, we know now that the plan is to build a new conveyance and, it's, and so we're rushing, we're scrambling now, trying to catch up and find out what we can do to benefit from this new conveyance coming through the reservation. Again, we are not invisible, even though we are treated like we're invisible. And as far as the salt and sea, you know, I, I also want to add to that. This catastrophe is, has been going on for, you know, more than 20 years, as has been said here, the salt and sea you know, this was a, an accident from the canals of the water that breached the, the Coachella Valley, even though our oral history and songs 
we talk about water that comes and goes. It was, it's been coming and going in the Coachella Valley for thousands and thousands of years. The Colorado River would flow into the Gulf and it would fill up with sand and then it would, the river would change and then it would fill up the Colorado, uh, the Coachella Valley, and then it would leave. This last time was a man-made you know, accident and it filled, and it was okay because in the 50s all the way to the 70s, it was a, res, you know, a resort destination event. Celebrities went there. There was fresh water, there was all kinds of fish, people were skiing, swimming. But as the water got diverted, such as Owens Lake, the water got diverted from Salton Sea to different areas that have the money to divert that water. It became, as it was said earlier, now it's practically a dead sea with the only water coming in is pesticide water from the farm runoff and the sewer water coming in from Mexico. So as it dries, that dust gets in the air and the community, the entire community breathes this and has rep respiratory illness. So we said this to all of the companies that are building these geothermal plants and they said they would help. And at my last Salton Sea Authority meeting last month, it was documented by doctors that did research and a study saying that there are biotoxins that are in the dust, that are in the air, and people are suffering from this. So we were saying, well, this is now, uh, an emergency, uh, an emergency event. There has to be emergency declaration, you know, and, but uh, it didn't go that way. But I think we, as we talk about it more, I think this will become a fact that's well known. And we have to stress this to the companies that are here because if they're bringing in, like we said, more trucks, more people, more houses, more roads, uh, those people too are gonna be affected by this toxic dust. What are the remedies? What are the resolutions to protect the people coming in? Are they giving them a disclaimer or, or you know, telling them that this is the type of environment that you're moving in? Uh, and I, in September of 2020, I testified everything that I'm saying here before the um, subcommittee of the House, a natural resource committee, uh, before oceans and water the, and wildlife. And, and with that, you know, Congressman Raul Ruiz, he was able to get funding uh, for the salt and sea, but it's a drop in the bucket. And with the Lithium Valley uh, Blue Ribbon Commission was created in January 22, I submitted a comment saying some of the stuff that I've been saying here today, that we have to have inclusion with the communities that, you know, you're creating this uh, ecosystem, this new ecosystem that's supposed to benefit uh, everyone that has an electric car. Well, it should benefit everyone that's within the community. And then in October 22, I followed up let, a letter uh, to the Blue Valley, or the Blue Ribbon uh, Lithium Valley Commission. And so, you know, with that, they came up with, in December, they came up with the uh, final summary report. And on that report is uh, 15 recommendations. And my point on that is they're just recommendations. So where do they go from there? There's no law, there's no, uh, implementation of mandates to say they have to follow any one of these recommendations, even though the recommendations were taken in from the community and the tribal, the tribal community also. So, and I like what the statement said, what Almero, Almero said, you know, is that, you know, they're, they're doing all these things. We as a tribe say what, you know, without us, uh, even though we give comments, even though we go to all of the workshops, even though we oppose and we get you know, environmental justice involved. You're still moving forward without us. And it seems, uh, you know, very hard to try to tackle, you know, with, with progress. I guess you would call it progress when you're uh, mining. But when we look at the generations of the future, the tribe's perspective is we want to be able to tell our generations, our sons, our granddaughters, and our, our grandsons, we want to be able to say, we, you know, we don't want to say that, you know, this was once a beautiful country or this once was a beautiful land. We want to be able to tell our grandchildren this still is a beautiful land. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Wow, that was a very, very impressive first round. So I think I'm so grateful.
Um, we're running a little bit short on time, so I'm, I'm going to be ask you very difficult questions and demand for short answers. <laughs> no, I mean, four, five, five, six minutes is all right. So we, we left plenty of time to the audience for questions. So Janet, I would like to start with you. Uh, how much federal support is for the project in the Salton Sea? So uh, that was a good question because I hadn't really heard much about a lot of federal support despite having Jennifer Granholm and, and a lot of other folks right there at the edge of the Salton Sea. Uh, and so I double checked and so far there's about $8 million pledged that hasn't necessarily arrived to help out with some roads and other infrastructure at the public level. That's what's come in from the feds. Imperial County, um, you know, it has challenges. It's a poor county. It did apply for a DOE incubator project of some sort. They were told that they were shortlisted. But um, a lot of the um, funds uh, are going to communities where um, Ford or GM or uh, Stellantis, others have big battery making operations that are planned. Uh, they're back east, they're in the southeast, other very deserving areas that need job growth along with all the attendant benefits. But um, not a lot has come to Imperial County from the federal level. I did mention the um, $400 million from California that has come in. There's also substantial and in many cases unknown levels of investment, <laughs> private investment. So that's a big cipher there. I ask these companies uh, how much they need and where they're getting backing from. Um, I haven't seen any sign of Chinese investment. I'd be really interested if there's any backing there for CTR or any of them. Um, but in any case, uh, there's not a lot of federal funding that's arrived yet or maybe it won't. Thank you so much. Um, Christina, we were talking about this a little bit earlier, so, and previous panels have touched this point. Um, often companies there uh, offer public services to the community, like, um, such as education, health insurance. What are the risks and consequences of those dynamics? Yeah. Um, well, in context, well, northern Chile, where it's uh, located uh, all these uh, very big mines, um, one of the areas that has the highest GDP of the country, but at the same time we have a very low um, response in, in infrastructure, education, health, etc. So sometimes, of course, um, mining companies uh, have uh, direct um, treatment with the with the community but also there's some agreements uh, well, Eduardo is here and knows very well <laughs> um, for example but can be very complicated at some point that the, the communities um, I mean the, the mining companies are actually giving some direct support to the community in terms for example health um, a recent example SQM has their own pharmacy so they bring they bring medicines to the very um, um, remote communities because uh, we are talking about very remote areas as well, because the state was not there. So the lack of the state also explained that uh, uh, relationship. But for other side as well, um, the, the money that uh, the, the, the communities um, receive, for example, with the agreement with Albert Marley, uh, they have created an environmental unit. So by the cons it's called Consejo de Pueblos Atacameños, so Atacameños Council, and and actually they're a very good example how also, also they can they can use the money in a in an important way. So, so they are actually working as an indigenous uh, scientific center, uh, try to get more knowledge about the salaries and also to be prepared when the future mining project will ask for the permissions. So they can basically have a better def environmental defense uh, in those cases. But um, I think also has, it's explained because of historically, you know, we, we there are areas that have been, let's say, abandoned by, by the state. And, but uh, always it's time to change. And I think uh, with the new plans, of, I hope that this relationship will be better for the communities. and. and and they can be as, as uh, at the same time more um, autonomous in the decision that they take. Thank you. 
I have so many questions, but I will let the mm-hmm. audience mm-hmm. take them. Mm-hmm. Um, um, Luis, talking, speaking about the your experience, like what kind of community ga- engagement and input has uh, there been over the life of these projects? Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. That's a good question. Um, sometimes I get real passionate. I forget about all the technical details going on. But um, uh, as, as I served on the uh, lithium commission commissioner, as a lithium commissioner, along with uh, Chairman Tortes, um, uh, we came up with quite a, f- quite a few number of recommendations. I mentioned one of them, AB 2757. I forgot to mention that. That's actually uh, one of the recommendations uh, that came out of the lithium commission. Um, one of the things that um, let me let me say this just because it's important that you know I'm, I'm going to tell you my my where I w- my mind was when I was in the lithium commission because the, the governor came out and was surprised as I've never seen a commission decommission itself mm-hmm. I I don't know where I remember was okay I know where we were and we as environmental justice were like this. There's only three of us to all this other larger number of people on the table. They didn't all represent Lithium Valley as the boundaries were drawn. So we didn't see it long term as really being advantageous to us. So we felt this this mechanism isn't going to work. And that's because a lot of these seats were appointed seats, you know, by the governor, by this legislator, by that other legislator, and so on and so on. You know, it's, it's the typical. So... Um, as regards to, to the question, um, it's part of SB 125, which is the lithium excise tax bill. It's not just the tax bill. That tax bill also contained what the county wanted, uh, which is a fast track mechanism known as the programmatic EIR. That takes away our power to negotiate with every project developer that has to, um, that meets uh, or is going to have substantial uh, enhancement uh, or disturbance of the ecosystem, right? It's California Environmental Quality Act. Um, by doing a programmatic EIR, you're sort of envisioning putting it all in one basket and saying, this is, this is all we think that's going to go here, right? Do one, and then everybody's done. It takes away our ability to negotiate. So we have to be more diligent how we do that. So in negotiations with the governor, we said, if you're going to give the county $5 million to do a programmatic EIR, you have to give the community $5 million so that they can engage meaningfully in, um, in this process because we see that as a fast-tracking, and we weren't in support of that. So the, the governor didn't give us f- $5 uh, million, but they did set aside a phenomenal number. I have to say this is like I've never seen it done. So it's not that I'm saying it's bad. I'm saying that they put $800,000 so that the community could engage um, meaningfully in the programmatic EIR. Never seen it, right? Wouldn't that be phenomenal if every time there's these type of fast-tracking mechanisms put in place that oftentimes are shoved to disadvantaged communities that they also put some money behind it and top. We were successful in doing that. Um, but we didn't stop there. We also identified that public health isn't a major component of the California Environmental Quality Act. So the governor's office, we suggested, hey, we want a health impact assessment. So then they also deliver on that, set aside $400,000 for a health impact assessment. And that was already granted to uh, the, uh, w- the contract given to San Diego State um, University. And so they're underway doing that uh, as well. Um, as far as uh, outreach, again, that's all part of the programmatic EIR. Uh, like government just loves to kind of throw a lot of obstacles in it, and we know that. So we're very fortunate to have, to have uh, a significant amount, I would have to say. This is phenomenal. Uh, foundations have really stepped up and are really contributing to making sure that the community has the resources to be able to negotiate uh, the best deal possible that we can negotiate, given the fact that we already know so many communities in so many countries have already um, ended up in a situation of disadvantage. We heard our through today and throughout the different presentations. Uh, so that's what we're doing. Multiple organizations are benefiting from those dollars. Uh, in fact, I should t- tell you, uh, Chairman Tortes, that the county set aside some money for tribes. So I'm hoping that 
they've delivered on that, and if they haven't, we should go together and let them remind them. <laughs> Part of those 800,000 were for <coughs> tribes, okay? So we'll make sure we do that if they haven't already. Um, but, you know, just to name just a, a couple of things that we're doing. Uh, also, we're, we're not just doing just a traditional outreach, reaching the hard to reach population, <coughs> reaching the disadvantaged population. It's a huge knowledge gap, but we also are implementing uh, and are being part of projects like California Jobs First, uh, doing health studies, uh, doing asthma studies. We're also part of the High Road uh, Training Partnership, also part of the, um, uh, the state programs. There's a lot of positive things that we're doing in the Imperial Valley. Again, uh, I, I did hear uh, the response um, uh, in regards to, uh, from Christina, in regards to, uh, I think the question was, when, community, when, when companies go out and offer support. Uh, we're no different. It's happened to us. You know, the companies go out there and drop a bunch of donations. Oh, here's donations. You're talking to a community that is starving. They're going to love you if you give them a dollar. Mm -hmm. Okay? And that's taking advantage of our vulnerable population. We need community uh, uh, benefits agreements. They need to be signed. Okay? We need, like I said earlier, we, we, we want the Cadillac model. Why? Because these companies, even the smallest companies, the projections of $300 million to over a billion dollars a year. We don't need a 500 donation so that our basketball team can buy, you know, some new uniform shirts. We don't need turkeys, right? A one-time turkey, you know, uh, when Thanksgiving comes around. You know, we don't need backpacks, you know, just when... Um, school, back to school. We don't need bikes only in Christmas. We need some real investment in our community. And if that deal isn't at the table, then I'm sure some of the, one of the other two companies or maybe other companies do want to negotiate. They want to have an adult negotiation, a business negotiation. Okay, that's what we're in this for. All right, we didn't learn all this knowledge just to see it on the sidelines, like I've said. So, that, you know, that's what, that's, Thank you this so is much. a high-level negotiation here, all right? Uh, would we have community health workers? Yeah. We have promotoras de salud? Yeah, we do. And that's to bring everybody to the table, not just to say, oh, you don't have enough information? Let me shove more paper so that you can have more information. Oh, you're not healthy enough yet? Let me shove more paper in your face so that you're healthier. No, this is a Wall Street negotiation. This is big business negotiation. And so any convening, any gathering that we do, is we're talking about billions, billions of dollars here. Okay, that's the negotiation we want to have. We welcome all the donations, you know, we thank them for that, but that's not the negotiation. Enforceable Community Benefits Agreement. Thank you. Thank you. And Chairman, we all, we've heard a lot of things, so it is, how hard is for a tribe or a community in general to evaluate the technical details, the risks, the revenues, the rewards of such for such projects? Uh, thank you for the question. For the, the tribe, the, I kind of touched on that uh, previously, and it, it is pretty difficult for us to get the details when there's no transparency. It's it's difficult for us to get you know the data. So if in intense, if they're not willing to share. You know what what they're gonna what they're gonna build. What are the risk assessments? What are the uh, you know the down draws to once the mine has become abandoned? What you know how do you return it to pristine if it if it can be? If not, uh, you know when you're talking about abandoned mine, because one day it will be another abandoned mine. Uh, there are right now over 500,000 abandoned mines in the United States, and uh, I think more than half of them are within 30 miles of native lands. So that kind of tells you, you know, it's, it's, it's just something that's occurring, that keeps occurring. Uh, what, do we, what do we do with those abandoned mines? I know there's some uh, executive orders to try to put funding in changing those abandoned mines and trying to make them into something else, but uh, this is probably not gonna last forever. So when we're talking about what, what does it look like, uh, we, we need those answers, right? And, we need to get those answers of what it looks like once they're gone, because that's gonna, that day is going to happen. We've seen that. And that's why I showed you the seal with the miner, because they came and they went. They took the the mineral, 
And just about everywhere you go in, in the world, the mineral is never infinite. Uh, the companies come, uh, they take, and then they leave, right? Without sharing of the data, without sharing of you know, the future of what that mine is gonna be in the end. And, and there's no mandates to say, you know, what, you know, true mandates of what they're supposed to do with the, the mine, even if it's drilling, when you're talking about uh, just drilling for steam and, and, uh, and taking the minerals from that, uh, you know, with the data that we, we hear, you know, the, the, the data for the drilling right now in the Salton Sea, uh, it's, if everyone doesn't know, at the beginning of the San Andreas fault line, and that goes all the way up to San Francisco. Uh, so there are, you know, discussions that we want a detailed report more than what was generalized on, on how more mining and drilling in that area of the fault line may, uh, you know, create more earthquakes. And, and you know, that's the reality that, that's happening. And I, and I know you can go on the earthquake website and there, there are 300 uh, mini earthquakes every day in the area of Salton Sea, right? And people get, you know, scared, but that's just a normal occurring event. But I think we need to just watch and get a detailed report of how that's, you know, gonna increase, how that may be affected. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's something that's never been done. They've never drilled at the beginning of a fault line. So how can they have answers for that? It, it's gonna be something that, you know, that science is gonna have to look at. Uh, furthering, you know, detailing about how to make uh, decisions in the future. I think if science merges with the indigenous, you know, knowledge that we have, I think they can come to a better resolution on how to preserve and protect the land once they've used it and, and then they're, you know, thinking of leaving. Instead of just taking and then leaving, I think they have to have the resolution of the tribal involvement again in that decision-making process. That way, you know, it would create better policies through the, through the government, like uh, Lewis is talking about. Uh, you know, we have to make sure that the connections to our culture and our heritage and our traditional life ways and the community, the resilience of the community that's been here, you know, for hundreds and hundreds of years, this will create the positive transformation of you know what 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 it can be look what it can look like in the future. Thank you so much. Um, I have very disciplined panelists, so I'm grateful for that. <laughs> uh, so we are perfect timing. We have like 15 minutes for questions from the audience. So if you wanna raise a question, please. Yes, sir. Come yeah, it's coming. So I would like to hear from the panel what it would look like for our uh, native communities and our disadvantaged communities, uh, as Chairman Tortas just indicated, what, if we would have agency in the decision-making processes instead of just being given the opportunity to make recommendations. I, and for specifically for Chairman Tortas, do you find that tribal sovereignty has helped or hindered your ability to negotiate with mining entities? Thank you for the question. Uh, I believe that tribal sovereignty has got us to the table. What, like I've said, you know, earlier, it's and I've been and I, when I testified to in Washington just uh, last year, I, I made that known too about the Salton Sea and that how can you know private entities have more power than the United States government. When I say United States government, I'm talking about Department of Interior and the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which has trust responsibility over all 576 tribes. So when we're talking about that agency responsibility to trust the, to protect the tribes, and a private entity comes in and says, well, we have all this money and we have all this power, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna mine anyways. And I, I just don't understand, and I said this in Washington, I don't understand how a private entity, just because of the money and the power, can still override what the trust responsibility is. So again, sovereignty gets us to the table, but it doesn't give us the power to battle what, what's, you know, what's in the power of the money and the mine and, and like lithium and gold and silver. Uh, it's, just, it's just, that's the power driver. And that even drives 
On the other side, that drives the political change, like we've seen with the geothermal plants. The state of California expedited the uh, the geothermal um, you know policy. On uh, they transferred the policy from the state to you know Imperial County. So right. So now it's it's you know I, that's just a fast track way for them to and we and I spoke on that and I said we need to stop that because I think they're going to try to get around CEQA trying to get around NEPA, but uh, uh, again, sovereignty, it, it is good to get us to the table, and I speak on it in Washington, I speak on it in Sacramento, but we need something more, you're right. I think we need an agency, the agency you know, to be created, and I know Lewis has talked about creating a coalition, a collaborative, uh, advisory committees need to be created with this Lithium Valley Commission. I think that was, that was a good uh, event, but I think we need to carry on uh, page two, you know, of that, because uh, without that, uh, I, I think we're just dropping the ball. Thank you so much. Um, please, mister. I have a brief question for Christina. Uh, you mentioned in passing indigenous peoples in Chile, I think. Um, I was a little surprised because my impression from what I've read is there are no longer very many indigenous people in Chile. And I've been to Chile three times over the years, and I don't really recall having any feeling that there was a substantial indigenous community there. So just wondering what it is you had in mind when you mentioned that briefly in your presentation. Yeah, the, the recognition that indigenous community live uh, in every country, I think, is, is, a, is a death. It's a very important. They are there, of course. In the north of Chile, as I mentioned, they are um, in, I really in the north, are Aymara, Quechua. And in the area of the Salado Atacama are the Licanantay, and Atacameños, and then to the south, Coya. That's only in the north. We're talking about thousands of people living there. Um, they, are, um, they have association, indigenous association. Not all the people that consider them indigenous are part of the association, but they are also living a lot in the, in, in the cities. Uh, but they're very active communities, of course. So there, there are 18 uh, different uh, associations in the whole basin of Salado Atacama. They're very well organized. They have their own administration and structure. And, and now also the, they're a very important part of the discussion about the lithium industry. But uh, still, of course, a lot to do. And now uh, I hear about uh, the colleagues about what's happening here. Some things are very similar. And I think this is a very important point. We have to recognize that uh, indigenous people live there and are alive. And, and they, they, they try to maintain their culture for, for the generations. So there are a lot of people, indigenous people there. Thank you. Professor. Mike's coming. My, my mic. <laughs> no mic. Uh, Dr. Adolor, uh, are there um, are there models for communities blocking major extractive projects either through the legal system or through the administrative system? So if you're going to proceed either through the courts or through the administration or through political lobbying, what are, what are some models for how a community would do this, and are there are there precedents uh, for that? Yeah, Chile has signed different agreements, international agreements. Like, uh, for example, we have the indigenous consultants. Every project has to pass through that. And now uh, the country is living this new lithium, national lithium strategy that, of course, uh, includes the dialogue with the communities. But there have been some, some troubles in between. Uh, some community consider that have not been uh, and participated enough. So, but it's, it's part of the negotiation that's happening now. Uh, but uh, it's very recently. So in the past, of course, the things were different. Uh, the, the big mining uh, projects start without the, the participation of the communities because they were not uh, a framework. So the environmental laws in Chile started in 1993, and, and, and so it's kind of recent. But of course, a lot of challenge about it. Uh, the participation is key, and, and we, we try to advance on that a lot in the in the project of the new constitution. For example, regarding the scientific, uh, the knowledge that you say you don't have access uh, to include the, the indigenous knowledge, because it's, it's very valuable. Uh, 
uh, we actually push uh, an idea to, to consider the, the system of knowledge, including scientific knowledge, indigenous knowledge, and as well local knowledge, because it is the only way they can really have a, a framework together and, and to deal with uh, complicated issues. Uh, if, if we just think in our only point of view, of course, we, we will not advance at all. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm from a Chinese environmental NGO and I'm currently a visiting scholar at the MIT Institute. And we are working with the communities to fight against pollution and uh, climate and environmental injustice. One of our biggest challenges comes from greenwash from companies. And uh, some companies created uh, new terminology like uh, green coal power plant uh, or environmentally friendly sustainable mining. So the public may criticize the community's resistance uh, as being unreasonable, meaning, meaning uh, seeking for more compensation and more benefit. So my question to panelists uh, from community is uh, how to respond uh, to this uh, greenwash from companies? Thank you. How do you respond to the greenwashing from community from companies? Greenwashing. Um, okay. So when you say greenwashing, meaning that they're saying, "Oh, we're about the green energy revolution, and we want to come in here and save the earth." That is that what you mean? But, but also that it's not going to damage. That it's not going to damage. Yeah. It's, it's going to be a green. Investment. And and okay. also that yeah, you're yeah, no. you're being unreasonable if you object. Great, great <laughs> question. You know, again, I think sometimes we get caught up in in in, in the, uh, the the banner messages, the buzzwords. Um, it's actually not that complicated. You just you just have to take away all the noise. It's all mathematics. That's all it is. Um, the, these companies are coming out here. I do the math, and, it's, and, I, and I shared earlier. We a nonprofit environmental justice organization are building the largest electric vehicle charging station, 180 kilowatts. Each one of our charger, our charging has four chargers. It's, a, it's the energy that we had to build is for each one is that equivalent of a super warmer. Okay, we're spending over $5 million to build this infrastructure. Okay, so that to me tells us these companies are not necessarily about the green energy revolution, right? This tells me that they are outright mining operations. That's what they are. And, hey, the price is right and the market is correct and they can predict profits, they'll, they'll extract lava for you <laughs> if, if, if it makes money, right? Um, these are mining operations. Now, I just want to continue to preface it that we're in favor of it because we're choking Right, and we're dying in communities where there's refineries, where there's extraction, where there's a legacy of contaminants. We know that. This is a transitional opportunity. These are transitional minerals. And these mining operations are coming out here and saying, we can make some money. Let's go out there, all right? Because I don't see them. You know, we, we have electric cars, right? I have um, level two chargers because we can afford this in my office. Right? We can't afford to provide free power for the fast chargers, but we, for the last two years, been providing free power through level two chargers in our office, free for anybody. Okay, I share that because you can't just say we're about this and not do something about it. Okay, let's do the math. These companies are in our neighborhoods. Well, how much have they done in regards? Are they putting solar panels right now in their existing operations? We have geothermal which is cleaner energy. Let's not get confused. It's not clean energy. It's cleaner. It's far better than fossil fuel, but it's only cleaner through technology that we use to, you know, send rovers to Mars and reach the moon, right, and, and create the best weaponry perhaps this, this world has. If we have that kind of investment, we can make it clean energy. But we're not doing that because the priority isn't there. So we say there's a priority, but it isn't really there because then we see the financial backing and billions of dollars into that industry, right? So um, 
So yeah, I mean, you know, we don't get distracted with the noise about the greenwashing, about saying that, because we're here to talk truth. So we say, you know, speak truth to power. Yeah, we've been around, we've been harmed historically. Yeah, you know, Chairman Tortes and the tribe's been harmed since the beginning of time, probably, right? And so, um, yeah, we don't, we don't, you know, it's all buzzwords and all that. It's fine. It's actions that matter. If it's not action that's there, if we can't see it and touch it and feel it, you know, if we don't see it improving the quality of our lives, if we don't see solar panels, you know, carpeting the, their entire facilities, you know, if they don't put in, you know, weather permit paints and and uh, um, everything out, all the technologies, if they're not decorating that, are they really about this or are they just mining? And this is business. Because if they were doing all of that, then we might be like, you know what? You're really doing some good stuff. Let you know, we'll, we'll be a little more more lenient in our expectations. Because you know what? You came in here and you're showing us, right? But what they're showing us is that the system can can be pressured to push permits, push, 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 because we're gonna miss the boat. You know, we're gonna miss this opportunity for jobs, right? So we don't get distracted with that noise. Thank we're here to do business. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, there's a famous TV show in Chile that always ends with a minute of trust. We, I know we, have, we didn't prepare this, but <laughs> we have four minutes left. So as the last panel of today's symposium, I would love you to each one of you to speak for one minute about what you feel about this issue and your final words. So Janet. So. One minute. <laughs> uh, I often have something that sticks in my head, and I think what's going to stick in my head today, well, there's many things from all the panels, but was your question about envision the future and how this could be done? Because I'm a cynical journalist. I expose the greenwashing. You know, I try and get at the dirt, you know, and um, I just think we're at a very interesting moment, as I think you might have said in terms of, you can't just check the box anymore with these community groups. Uh, you really need to engage. And it's an interesting point of power for uh, Native Americans in the United States uh, and recognition there. And I just think it's going to be very interesting to see how it shakes out uh, in a place like Imperial County uh, it could very well be that it goes the way it's always gone. I mean, we're all human, and it's not just the outside companies. We have local politics and local politicians who, you know, are willing to cut the deals sometimes. But it's just a very interesting moment, I think, historically. I think part of it is that you've got uh, well-meaning officials who want to solve climate change who aren't just about the money. And so this clash between old fashioned mining and destructive activities and great big solar over this fragile desert or wind in these rural communities, they, they have some discomfort around that, you know? So um, they're willing to maybe push a bit harder, to try harder. I'm probably over my minute. Yeah. But I'm gonna keep right, my yeah. quest that question <laughs> in mind. That's all right. Mind. Thank you. Christina, if you wanna go next, or if you wanna go last, I see which. No, that's fine. Well, I'm sure that 10 years ago was not possible to, to do a seminar like that. So that's change, show how things are changing. And, and, and talk about openly as well. Because at least uh, in Chile, of course we talk about everything, but also we receive uh, a lot of consequences in different ways. So first the thing we need to talk about honestly. Uh, Sometimes the, the truth could be inconvenient, but we need to, to open the, 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 the positions and the opinions as well, as, as you mentioned. Sometimes it's just business. But we're talking about, we're living the climate crisis, the, the, something that never happened before, I mean, in, in, our, in, the, in the humanity. So we need to do real stuff. And, and for that, first is to also talk, uh, to, to talk about education. People have to understand how much it costs to produce what we're using every day? Where the thing are coming from? Where the lithium is coming from? What happened to have the lithium and to copper and everything we were talking about today? 
how much damage also can produce to obtain these minerals. Um, because people don't know. Every, every electric car ha needs to have a sign saying where does lithium come from? Who did it? Who produced it? Because it is the only way to have conscious, I mean, and a, a worldwide conscious about what we are doing. So the price to buy something, a cell phone, an electric car, is more than the one uh, the market play, the market is showing. Is is far more. So um, I think we need to, to need to work a lot about this, this global conscious about what we're doing to Earth, and and that is the only way I think that we can do things better in the future. Thank you, Chairman Ortiz. Yes, thank you. Um, so when we're talking about uh, what we can do to, you know, better these types of situations with mines and, and in my point of view, the indigenous people, you know, the uh, United Nations has a policy and I, I think United States is part of the United Nations, right? And it talks about free prior informed consent, right? And, <laughs> and it, it just says simply, right, the indigenous people uh, must be consulted, right, before any uh, government or developers uh, effectively, you know, working within the area, and and the indigenous people determine who is to be consulted, and and that's simple, right? So if we fall back on that and kind of mandate that, that would that would kind of make it simple. But you know, it, it's it's easier said than done. But for our tribe and the tribes within the area, you know, we we're kind of we're in support of the mining. Also, we looked at the environmentals. We looked at how are they doing this. The footprint is small. But we also look at the, the ecosystem footprint. We're talking about the footprint of, you know, when the, once it's there, does everyone have clean air? No. Does everyone have clean water there? No. In fact, today, as we are sitting here and I'm drinking this water, my people on the area that I live do not to this day have clean drinking water. Sometimes I feel like going to uh, state or Washington with a bottle of water from our tap because it has arsenic in it, right? It's tainted with arsenic. And so the EPA says do not bathe, do not wash, do not feed it to your babies, carcinogenic. So, and we still don't have it to this day. I'll go home and, and, and have to drink from the sparkless bottle water. So, you know, those are the things that we, we need to look at when we're looking at the entire community. And I know some parts of the community, as Lewis knows, has the same uh, water because we're an aquifer, right? Where it's not stops at the reservation, it's in the next town. and so those towns also have the arsenic. So clean air, we don't have that in the Salton Sea area in Imperial County. Clean water, we also do not have that to this day. And yet mil billions, mil billions of dollars are gonna be spent in developing and taking this mineral from the area. Uh, and I know that didn't happen in Silicon Valley, right? Uh, so that's, that's all we need to look at. I believe we need to look at you know, how we can resolve those type of issues. Thank you. Yeah. And you leave get the final words. Yeah, no, um, very passionate, not angry. <laughs> 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 we're, uh, we're very excited about this opportunity. Uh, as an environmental justice organization, um, we have, uh, um, you know, we all, as, as a movement, um, we talk, you know, and this was a hard one, you know, do we want this mining? I had to check with a lot of elders in the movement throughout the state, and and the conclusion was, well, this is a, the transition right now. It's not the forever plan. Um, the um, it's going to be important to assure that the government, as they're investing, perhaps billions, no billions of dollars for sure combined, that they are making sure that there are community benefits agreements built in to those dollars. We've, it's not the first time that we go through this exercise. Symbol Technologies, they uh, came up with a patent. Um, they got, you know, state, perhaps federal dollars, I know for sure the state. And when uh, they weren't able to get a business going at that time, they walked away with a patent. And then the uh, state was like, what happened? That was our money. I was like, yeah. This is a law school. Make sure you put enough controls in there and that money to make sure that they don't walk away with the public's dollars for their own private benefit. Those technologies are now, we're probably paying for it again, 
right? Because these companies are probably not developing it again. They're just like, I'll just buy the patent, you know? That's probably what they're doing. But we're giving them money again to innovate again. It just, again. So uh, I, one thing I want to just leave you with is we've been very, been very successful at securing um, the tax, the lit lithium excise tax, which um, it's a tax on the sale of lithium. Let's not get confused. Not the project and operation. It's a, a sale of, of, it's on the ballot in November. So the industry is saying, we're already giving you this tax, right? It's important that you know that two of the three companies out there was lobbying against that tax. So they can go parade and say, look, look what I'm giving you. No, you never gave it to us. We had to spend our own uh, lobby money to make sure that that, um, that that bill passed, SB 125. Two companies actively worked against, while one um, said that's fair. That's what that's the kind of bit, that's the kind of conversations we want to have. You're going to have an opportunity in November to decide whether that those taxes, not just not just the um, SB 125, but other taxes in California, stay in the ballot or not. All right. So at this point, we might end up with nothing. So that brings us back to where we're at right now. This is our real situation right now. Permits are being pushed, jobs, jobs, jobs. We have to intervene legally, right, through the law to make sure that because the system failed us, we unfortunately have to utilize legal remedies, which should be the last resort. But it's being, as now it's the first resort. It's the only mechanism we have and our only defense. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Another applause for the beautiful panelists.